Now go for it. All right. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrines of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, and of instructions about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits, for it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. For land that is drunk or yeah, has drunk the rain that all, uh, often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those who, uh, for whose sake it is cultivated receives a blessing from God, but if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to begin uh, being cur uh, cursed, and its end is to be burned. So All right, we're, this is Hebrews yeah. 6, by the way, for anybody who doesn't know on the recording who listens to this later. Yep, the millions sure. are listening. This yeah. is Hebrews millions, chapter six. Billions, billions, man, billions. Could be trillions. Oh, it's actually quintillions. Could yeah, exactly. You never know. Uh, never know. This is, and I, I read from the English Standard Version, which is by far the greatest version. You know, King James only is, but for English speaker. Um, but um, no, what's really powerful here? Go ahead. You no, you go, you go. Uh, I was gonna say. Uh... It's interesting that they uh, tasted the age to come, but some people think the age to come is still coming. So how did they taste of it? It's still yet to become, you know, the new age or new uh, covenant. Yeah. So that's a yeah. good observation. Um, what about verse one? Leave, therefore, let us leave standing the elementary teachings about Christ. That Greek word for elementary, arche. It's a different word than the word for elements in the previous chapter that we looked at already. Stoichia. Stoichion. Elementary or elements, they're different different words. Um, so what's fascinating is it's like, therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrines of Christ. So it's like, okay, so... What's the elementary doctrines of Christ? Like the stuff that he just was talking about in the earlier chapters? Or is it this mm -hmm. laying again a foundation of repentance of dead works, faith towards God and instructions about washings and laying of hands, the resurrection of dead and eternal judgment? Is that the elementary doctrine? That would be quite interesting because... If, if that's the things that everybody should should already know, and we should just move past oh, that it's already, it's on like, everything. yeah, like people can't can people can't get on to the meat or whatever, right? Everybody's like, I, I, would these things be considered milk? Because if it is, then everybody's still on milk because can't nobody agree on those things. Yeah, I mean, a lot was just said in Hebrews, you know, one through five. I mean talk about the order of Melchizedek him being you know greater than the angels greater than Moses you know all greater these than Joshua, greater, greater than the Sabbath greater than all these things I mean that maybe is the element because he's saying he's like therefore so everything he just said is like therefore let us leave the elementary words of the Messiah or the teachings or doctrines of Christ and go into maturity not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and a faith towards God. Yeah, I mean it's it's definitely a, a fascinating subject. I mean, because like you just said, those every single thing, repentance from dead works. Well, what does repentance mean? There's debate on what that is. I mean, faith towards God, I guess that's not debated, but possibly could, but definitely about instruction about baptisms and stuff like yeah. that. Yep. Definitely laying on of hands, definitely resurrection of the dead, definitely eternal judgment. I guess the timing. Well, and the okay. nature think, of that. think about it like this, though. Like these are all things that are highly debated by everybody today. 
but the Hebrew writer is writing this in like the 60s and he's writing to people that you can tell from in other parts of the of the letter that have already been Christians for like 30 something years. Yeah. Like they've been Christians for like so if you're writing a letter to a group of Christians who've been Christians for 30 something years, then yeah, surely you would have a decent handle on those things by that point. It's not like we're talking about in the year 2024 and there's somebody who just became a Christian yesterday and they've never read the Bible. They don't know anything. Right. Yeah, of course. So that's, you know, something to think about is if people are like, Oh, well, these are all things that we should just get over and not debate. And it's like, well, well, that, that might be the case. If maybe you've been a Christian, you've been studying the Bible for, or, or you knew all these things for 30 years, but yeah, so keep keep the audience relevance in mind, right? With that, mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah, man. To me, these still are the simple things. I don't know where this is going, but I'm guessing you know it's more the actions that are the meatier part, like you know, helping the widow, helping the orphan, helping the prison, helping the sick, helping the homeless, sharing your goods. You know, things of that nature are going to be the more mature things. The actual yeah. actions, not just your beliefs. Yeah, at this point, they've been Christians for 30-something years. They should have already already known all the things here. And like I guess like Rob said, they should be actually acting out their faith and stuff. Like Besides all just believing in certain doctrines, they should already have a good grasp on by this point. So they should be doing other things. Right. Yeah, I mean, I remember when... Um coming out of the hebraic roots the book of hebrews was pretty much the book that did it and i remember like how i would interpret this was like you know the meat like going on to the meat well it's pretty fascinating that this melchizedek priest order like even just the the word melchizedek is only used twice in the entire old testament Genesis, Genesis 14, 14 and then Psalm 110. Psalms 110. That's it, twice. And it's just in passing. Like, there's nothing. That's it. There's no, you don't know who the person is. You don't know what. It's just, that's it. The only However, other place he's brought up is in Hebrews, right? Yes. The only other place is Hebrews. And he brings it up so many more times. He talks about, you know, when you get to chapter 7. He goes into the person that met Abram and all that, or Abraham, or you know, whatever. But it's just like, dude, so much stuff here. And I always thought that the meat, like, to go on, leave the elementary stuff, you know, was like the the beginning, the the early foundations, like what he just mentions there. But go on to the meat, learn the Melchizedek priest order, learn the true priest order that we are under no longer the levitical because that's the whole premise here is don't go back to judaism the levitical system is about to die the only priest system that's going to stand forever because that's what the scriptures say is the melchizedek priest order and it's fascinating because once you get to i mean he he's he has been mentioning again i mentioned earlier that jesus is better than the angels he's higher than all the angels you can see hebrews chapter one you know, he's better than Moses. He's better than um, now. And then now he's trying to get into this idea that he's better than the Levites. And 7 through 10, chapter 7 through 10, which we're about to get into, the meat of the book of Hebrews, in my opinion, is just overwhelming. And it's, it's that that's a major foundation to this meat is understanding jesus's role as the high priest and that this priesthood supersedes the milk uh the levitical priesthood yeah i think yeah. we're gonna get into that in this a little bit later in this chapter potentially that concept oh yeah well, i mean he's already it, mentioned it in chapter five yeah this, uh, this does last time yeah this does come right in the middle because melchizedek's in five and seven so this chapter's like mm-hmm. right in the middle of it right yeah, and that, that's what, like, really got me to be, like, I mean, again, even in the Hebrew roots, like, we still agree, like, Jesus is the high priest in the order of Melchizedek. It's just that, you know, we still see a relevance for the Levitical system here on earth. As Hebrews 8.4 says that Jesus would not be a high priest on earth. 
seeing that there are priests who already offer gifts according to the law. Um, obviously, that was written during a time period in which the law was still being followed um, on earth, but um, well, with the Hebraic then, roots so, mindset, you know. I was about to say, but then, but then you get to chapter 12 and you realize, oh, the Christians that he's writing to, he's telling them, you know, you've not come to this mountain, but you've come to this one, right? So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, the Mount uh, Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem. Yep. yep. Yeah, no, it's mm -hmm. really good stuff. Um, I think we're going to get to in this chapter too, where it talks about the first covenant or the first. Uh, I think it's in this chapter. In chapter six, we're talking about going back to the first instead of the second. Uh, I think it's 611 or something. I can't remember from looking last time. Um, well, in okay, so what about. Well, does anybody have anything else on the first three verses? Mm. Say that, that last part again. Did anybody have anything else they wanted to say on the first three verses? No. I mean, I have some other stuff to say on the other verses. But... Well, I was going to say, like, like the next thing here is like four through six, right? Which that's some a lot of stuff in that, right? Major stuff. It's impossible for those who've once been enlightened and have uh, tasted the heavenly gift. Hmm. What do y'all think that is? Enlightened and tasted the heavenly gift. Yeah, I think so to me that's their salvational position. That was, that's what I was thinking. I would say that, yeah, they're Christians. Yeah, like, like in, enlightened, like, through what they've learned, like, the, they, they've heard the gospel, they taste the heavenly gift, like, they became Christians after after receiving the knowledge. Now, do you think these people have the Holy Spirit? Yeah, because it says right after, and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess the first part, the enlightening and the tasting of the heavenly gift is about their positional salvation in their they were in Christ and they became partakers of the Holy Spirit, which, you know, you can read Acts 8, Acts 19, Romans 1, 1 Corinthians 9, Galatians 3, 2 Timothy 1. You can see how the Christians got the Holy Spirit. Um, and tasted the goodness of God's word and the powers of the mellow aeon. Uh, Ion about about yeah the the powers of the coming age the mellow ion coming age what do you think that means they tasted the goodness of God's word and the powers of the coming age it could mean like uh where Paul uh. You know, or that verse that says, I can do all things through Christ. Well, Paul was talking about like how content he was in all positions, you know, in all statuses. So it could mean like, you know, they, they had started being that content in Christ or, you know, their peace in Christ, even no matter what position they were on on earth, no matter if they're going through suffering or joy. Would Would we say that? Because it says they tasted the powers of the coming age. There are lots of scriptures that seem to connect the end of the old age with the destruction of the temple or the destruction of Jerusalem, right? Matthew 13, Matthew 24, Matthew right. 20. So that old, that old covenant age had not fully ended yet. Like as long as the temple still stood, they were still doing the animal sacrifices, et cetera. But these people had already experienced the people the Hebrew writers writing to, they've already experienced what the new age would be like because they've already come out of the old. Right? Yeah, yeah, it could be, yeah, yeah, it could be that they weren't like offering animal sacrifices, things of that nature, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Because mm -hmm. they recognize Christ as their sacrifice. 
Yeah, and like you had brought up in Hebrews 12, where it says that you, know, you had the Jews going to Mount Zion, the old covenant, that's where they went, whereas the Christians, they go to the heavenly Jerusalem. So when it talks about they tasted the powers of the coming age, do we think that means like uh, salvation? Salvation being a part um, of the covenant? Yeah, I don't know, because it already said they already had the, the the salvation earlier in the chapter, so it seems like this could be slightly different. What would these powers of the coming age like they've they've received the they've received enlightenment? Like the healings, things of that nature, the spiritual gifts. Okay. So because okay. So if we if you view if we view, view it as that, we think about I guess is it, would it be because the new covenant age was kind of breaking in during the during that transition period. Like the old hadn't been fully gone yet. Like was it chapter eight, verse thirteen? 13. It was growing old. Yeah, eight thirteen, growing old, soon to vanish, ready to just ready to disappear. Mm -hmm. So, is it because in the new covenant, people who were in Christ all talks about how they could do they they had the miraculous gifts and things whereas the Jews in Judaism in the old covenant they couldn't do those things but the Christians in Christ they could do those things maybe that's what it's about it's possible but I mean, it says heavenly gift, so obviously that's miraculous. Um, um, well, yeah. yeah, if you do a, well, yeah, I mean, obviously they, it even says powers of the coming age, but I don't know, you know, obviously anyone who had the Holy Spirit at that point did some sort of miracles. I mean, there's like nine different gifts in First Corinthians 12. Um, doesn't necessarily doesn't say which ones in particular these Christians that Hebrew writers write to did, but I guess they did something. Uh, all right. It says verse six, having committed apostasy, having committed apostasy or fallen away to restore them to repentance. So back in verse four, it's impossible for those who've once been enlightened. Then it says all those other things and have committed apostasy or have fallen away. So it's impossible to restore them or renew them to repentance. I think that's saying that once they go back to the Old Testament, that you're not supposed to go, they can't go back to the New Testament. Yeah, that that, that word impossible, that's a pretty strong word. Right. It makes me think about uh, mine and Zach's Hebrew ex experience. I mean, it's just like, does anybody actually like teach that stuff? Like, let's just say somebody in their church today is preaching the word, they're an elder in the church, they fall away for like two years, and then they're like, you know what, I made the biggest mistake in my life, I'm going to go back, uh, I'm not going to be an elder, I'm just going to go back to church on Sunday and be a Christian, like, does that mean they can't come back? Well, I think anyone today can come back because, well, in my view of things, no one has become a partaker of the Holy Spirit today. So I don't think this verse has to do with anything about what's going on today. So at this time period, the first century, when this was being written, if people had received the Holy Spirit and they abandoned that and went back to Judaism, I don't know what else God could do to try to convince uh, people to come back. Let me let me say this. Could that be the blaspheming of the Holy Spirit? Yeah, I think so. Or it's like unforgivable. Yeah. I, I think I think that's, that's interesting. interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. Yep. Cause I mean I mean what what else could God do at that point to try to convince the people to stay in Christ? Like if you've already you know, heard the gospel, you believed it, you've been given supernatural abilities, you can raise the dead, heal people, do all kinds of stuff. And if you throw all that away and go back to Judaism, like 
what, what else yeah, can God give you? Like, what, what else can God give you to try to get you to come back? Like, what else can He do? He's not no, going to be interesting then, really. Today, you couldn't blaspheme the Holy Spirit in that manner. That's right. That's right. And I don't, and I don't think you can. Uh, I, th- I think as long as you're still breathing, you can always come back to Christ in this life for us today. Um, but not for them. Very different situation going on. Mm-hmm. I mean, think about what they were doing too, right? Because they're going, they're casting the their salvation to the side. They're casting the gifts of the spirit to the side, and they're they're abandoning all those things and going back to their animal sacrifices. And I think it's in chapter ten where it talks about when they do that, they're insulting the spirit and they're trampling under their foot, uh, under their feet, the blood of the Son of God. Was it five or six that said that you're you're uh, crucifying him a second time? Uh, it's right chapter here. I, 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 well, it's, it's right. It, I thought it was right. Oh, yeah, that might be chapter ten. It, it says it right here, though. Right here in, in verse six, uh, having committed apostasy, and uh, it's impossible having committed apostasy yeah. to restore them or renew them to repentance. Since their own harm, they are crucifying the Son of God again and exposing him to public shame but let me ask let me, let me ask this thing baptism mm-hmm. you're being buried with christ you know you're mm-hmm. dying with christ all that kind of stuff it's kind of like again him being on the cross you going through that ritual if you want to say it that term mm-hmm. of you acknowledging your death it's like you on the cross you getting dunked in the water is like you is like Jesus being put inside the tomb. You coming out of the waters is like you being raised just like Jesus was raised on the third day. Somebody blaspheming once they've been a Christian, they had their hands laid or they've had the apostles hands laid upon them to in order to receive the Holy Spirit, as we see in Acts chapter eight. Could this be? That once a person that is in that situation, they are a born-again believer with the Holy Spirit, performing miracles, they leave Christianity to go back to Judaism or whatever. Then when they want to come back, they would have to get baptized again, and and they're crucifying Christ again? I don't think they would ever. I I think this teaches they, they... They wouldn't. It's impossible for them to come back. Yeah, but, and and that's kind of like what I'm getting at. Like it's it's because you can only do that once, and once you leave that, you can never do that again because Jesus only died once. Right, right. So you and all, can't like yeah. keep redoing it over and over again. Right, and also think about the historical situation of these people. If they went back to Judaism at the time the Hebrew writers writing this letter, in just a couple of years, if they went back to Judaism, guess what's about to happen to them in, in the next few years? Yeah, it's going to be destroyed. Dead. Like over a million of them get slaughtered, right? So, yeah, there's no coming back. That could also be why it was impossible because, you know, you were going to be destroyed pretty soon. Yep. I think I think that's probably a part of it, too, for sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah, definitely it's some interesting stuff. But yeah, I definitely think I definitely I definitely in my mind always connect this passage with the was it Matthew twelve about the blaspheming the mm-hmm. Spirit. The Holy Spirit, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Well that kind of does away with the well, I'm gonna say want the whole once saved, always saved idea. But there's other versions yeah, at, comment, least for that, so, at least for that time period for sure if not yeah, I, I, yeah yeah i guess if we wanted to talk about others uh, other uh time periods besides them like what about us today we could look at other verses that kind of show that it's once i always say it's not true and other other passages as well yeah as a calvinist um looking at these passages they would I guess, lean on the idea where it says um, who tasted and they have shared. So 
a Calvinist would interpret this as somebody that's only going to a Sunday service. Like in the first mm -hmm. century, it's not somebody that actually has been baptized. They're not a Christian. It's somebody just like looking from the outside in. But again, it makes no sense because look, the, and the mean, reason look, that they the, the reason that they they say that is because of the word tasted. What about it's the rest not of actually it? consumed? I guess you could say. But what about the rest of it? They had been enlightened. Falling away. I would say for me, it's the falling away part. Yeah. How can you fall away yeah. from yep. something that you've never been in? You can't yep. fall unless you start walking. Yep. So you're in, you yep. know. Yep. So that's that's the nail in the coffin for that's me. That's a great uh, statement there, Zach. Absolutely. And, unless you're and, looking. and then the rest of the part is to uh, restore them again to repentance, meaning that they've already been repentant. They've already repented. They've already been connected to the death of Jesus. This is why it's crucifying the Son of Christ, the Son of God again, mm -hmm. because a true Christian would have been crucified with Christ. Romans chapter six via through baptism, and once you fall away because you bat you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, you can't go redo that again because you're crucifying Christ all over again. And he only died once. That's it. Nope. Not you. Not again. Just one time. The Bible is very clear. The Book of Hebrews, mm -hmm. chapter ten, once and for all. Well, the, what you said about you can't fall if you didn't stand. Same thing with the uh, Galatians five verse four. Right. Uh, it talks about uh, you've been severed from Christ. You've fallen from grace. You can't be severed if you weren't attached. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Same thing. Oh, by the uh, well, even Revelation two. Remember with the seven, the seven letters, uh, the very first church, the church at Ephesus, he says, you have left your first love. You can't leave if you weren't there. And, and we know the Ephesians were saved at one point because, was it Ephesians 1 verse 7? They've been redeemed by the blood of Christ. Uh, uh, they were covered by the blood of Christ. We, we uh, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, you've been saved by grace through faith. Yeah. So we know the Ephesians were saved at, at one point, and yet in the Revelation 2, it said they had left their first love. They needed to repent. So, um, All right. Let's see. Verse 7 and 8. Or do y'all have more y'all want to talk about on 4 through 6? I mean, I just think that seven through eight is just kind of like, I never really paid too much attention to these two verses. It's kind of like there's so much through one through six that you're just like, I'll skip seven through eight. But it definitely um, is there for a reason. Um, I mean, verse, I mean, it seems like verse seven talking about the new covenant, the Christians, and verse eight's about the old covenant, right? Yeah, it's about to be burned. Yep. First and about to be burned. Is there the word uh let me see here? Uh no mellow in that verse. There was a mellow back in verse uh five about the powers of the coming age. Okay. But there is a uh ingus, which is about to be. In verse eight, is that like the near thing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. Well, and maybe we could look at or talk about the word because I just uh, looking at um, on the Blue Letter Bible the word uh, for world because it's like they've tasted of uh, they. They've tasted of that which is to come, right? The world to come. So they've had a taste of the thing that's to come, which is the world. So it's like, well, what have they tasted? So mm -hmm. I looked up world. And so it says forever. It's I am. It's I am. Yeah, age. Yeah, age. 
Not called unbroken much. age, perpet perpetuity of time, eternity, and then and then the second meanings like come in, you know, the worlds, the age. But I'm like, so so then I kind of go, this is how I kind of study, like this is how I kind of try things on, I guess. Like, so they've tasted of forever. They tasted of an un, you know, the unbroken age. They 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 had a taste of the perpetuity of time. Basically, they tasted eternity. And right. So they had a they tasted God, right? Like Jesus, is like this is what is eternal life? What is eternity? It's to know the Father and the Son. So they they've literally tasted, uh, like when you when you experience something, when you when you actually get to try out the bread that Zach makes. It's different yeah. than just looking at pictures, isn't it, Rob? So if you just see a picture, it's not the same experience. But when you taste it, you're like, okay, now I'm convinced. Like now you've, what did you say earlier? You've you've like ingested it, right? Oh, it's like we were talking about earlier about uh, reading or whatever the uh, the 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 milk. You know, they read it. They they uh, believed it, but you know, tasting it. And, is different than uh, believing, you know, the kind of experiential uh, thing that they can really grasp on to. Yeah. Yeah, can you look up that word, uh, like in the great... Uh, what word Andrew? is it? What what word? World? It's I own. Yeah, it's, it's age. Age. yeah, it's just the age. It just means a period of time. Okay, so and is there different wor words yeah, for that? I mean, a, like, it's, a, it's a forever yeah, age. If it, so. if, it, if it was world, it'd be co probably cosmos. Yeah, yeah I mean, there's just like five forever. words for world. The new so, age so it's forever. not so the, the so because it's not forever. the word cosmos, it's not the earth as we know. It. It's not talking about this literal physical earth, but it's talking about something. What? Like time like more, more yeah a time spiritual period. like a new covenant like more spiritual okay which could be on this earth or do you think this is speaking of like the heavenly world to come a spiritual world to come it could it, it be talking it, about it, it could be either one more honestly. than just more than just the the ages on this earth could it be talking about an eternal age like a heavenly age not an earthly age i'm just okay so that's interesting yeah well, they, it's good to look well, at what it's it, not saying which is cosmos yeah. right. so that's interesting Andrew. Well, and, and it's, i think it, it can be both because we're spiritual yeah. beings here yeah then we're spiritual beings you know when we get into heaven as well without our earthly tent I think it can be. Well, I, I'm just thinking to myself, like, what does this mean? Like in the Bible, I'm trying to get like, would this be something like say John who, who was, you know, before the throne room, right. He was in the spirit on the Lord's day and he was given the, it would be like, like Paul when he's caught up, quote, you know, when he's caught up to the third heaven, like he tasted of that thing. And it really lit a fire under him, right? Like, well, I'm sure we could agree, I mean, Paul spent the rest the of his life. The Holy Spirit, where maybe we don't have that same, like, you know, experience. You know, they had the baptism of fire and things of that nature, or and the tongues, you know, where a lot of people don't necessarily, I know some people think they'll still happen, but, you know, they seem a little different, per se, what happened then and what happens now. Well, and, and yeah, they would have tasted of it, you know, more so than maybe we might, even though we we might have more of a mental. And 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 well, and who's to say that you know what they were doing, it isn't similar to what they'll be doing like in heaven, right? Like they could speak in tongues and things. Like who's to say in heaven, like you won't be able to communicate with all your brothers and sisters in Christ, regardless of what language they spoke on earth. Right, like I don't, I don't think you'll have to necessarily learn like what's heaven going to be like. Is everybody going to have the same language in heaven, or 
will it be like everyone wants, will have earthly languages, but you automatically are downloaded with knowing how to converse with your brothers and sisters in Christ and heaven, speaking all the different languages automatically without having to learn them? I, I have no idea. I don't know. I don't know if the Bible teaches one way or the other on those kind of things. And then it talks about the language being pure or some uh, uh, Bibles translated as one in Isaiah, I think it is. Um, are we ready for verse nine? I think so. I think Zach read through verse eight. Um, I guess eight through twelve is kind of the next, or nine through twelve is kind of the next section. Anybody want to read nine through twelve? Yeah, I think I can handle that. All right, so let's see. Dear friends, I am not saying this because I think it's happening to you. We really expect that you will do better, that you will do good things that will result in your salvation. God is fair, and he'll remember all the work you have done. He'll remember that you showed your love to him by helping his people and that you continue to help them. We want each of you to be willing and eager to show your love like that the rest of your life. Then you'll be sure to get what you hope for. We don't want you to be lazy. We want you to be like those who, because of their faith and patience, will get what God has promised. I think that's what I was talking about, you know, the the helping, you know, and the love being shown through their actions is more what it was about than, you know, granted, you need the belief for your salvation. But once you have that, then you got to go on to actually being doers of the word once you understand your salvation. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, can you read your verse 12 again? Yeah. Let me pull it up here. We don't want you to be lazy. We want you to be like those who, because of their faith and patience, will get what God has promised. So you said, we'll get, future tense, right? We'll get what mm -hmm. God has promised. Right. Mm -hmm. um, let me look this up. Uh, See how the King James puts it here. What verse is that one that says will uh, or something? 12. 12. This one says that you should not become dull, but imitators of the ones through belief and long suffering inheriting the promises. It's present tense in the Greek. Yep. That's King James. That's why, that's inherit, why it should be in, inherit. But followers of them who through faith and patience inherit. That doesn't put a time limit on it. doesn't say it's past. doesn't say it's future. Could it's be now. Could have been so then. It would just be our inheriting. Like our inheriting. Right? Yeah, our inheriting. Or... I'm, I'm reading the uh, Apostolic Bible Polyglot. That's what that says. What? That's a that's a version? Apost apostolic what's that? Polly well, oh, interesting. So who who do you think this is when it says so so the Hebrew writer says to the people he's writing to, don't be lazy, be imitators of those who by faith and perseverance are inheriting the prom there were people inheriting the promises that the Hebrew writer is telling his audience they should be imitators of these people who are presently inheriting the promises. Who would that be? Anyone uh, receive anyone in, that's the been receiving in the gifts? Yeah, I mean, like, like the apostles, people like the apostles and the Christians at other churches, maybe who are doing what they're supposed to be doing by not falling away. Imitate, be like those people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and they're inheriting. They're they're presently inheriting the promises. So it would definitely be the apostles and other Christians. Because when they died, blessed are they who died in the Lord from now on. Greater blessing for dying under the new covenant. No Hades for those people. It's good. 
Um, and what's interesting is that, you know, like the new covenant in my mind in verse six, it says, but we are persuaded concerning you beloved of better things and having deliverance. If even thus we speak. So it's like a better things. What What's yep. better about it? Exactly. Well, yep. Well, when you salvation. die, yeah, salvation. And when you die, you immediately get to be with the Lord with your glorified body. You don't have to wait around like the Old Testament saints did for 4,000 years. Yeah, you have complete forgiveness. Yep. Like you actually get forgiven and, and you get not, not only in a positional sense, but you actually get to literally be with the Lord in heaven. Yeah, I know. It's pretty good stuff. That's definitely better. That's definitely better than the old covenant. There's no more veil. Yeah, that's what I was that's what I was thinking too. Because what is your inheritance ultimately? It's okay, you can say heaven, you know, maybe it's healings if you receive, you know, all these blessings, but ultimately your inheritance is Christ himself, isn't it? Yeah, being being with Jesus. Yeah. That's the greatest so, thing there could be. So 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 it could be it could it could be meaning referring to any of those people who are see- seeking after going after you, you know what i mean yeah in, be any like, of the, be like any, them. yeah any of the apostles or the other christians who were doing what they were supposed to by not falling away yep. like these people were yeah mm-hmm. yeah okay that's good uh I mean, is it kind of is that is that kind of like what Adam and Eve did? Did they fall away? Like, yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely, because they were created perfect. Like, they were created in a perfect state with God. They were walking with God. They would have lived forever. They would have ate from the tree and lived forever. Like, it, they were created perfect, and they threw it away. And they got thrown out of the garden. They decided. They decided. Well, we'll try. Well, we know what God said we should do, but you know what? Uh, and they were tasting of God, right? Yep. So they 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 knew who the Lord was. Adam walked with God. Okay. So and yet they went, nah. Mm, you know what? We're gonna try this. They could come back. And though. then what happened? It's oh look. Then what happened? He said the earth, the land cursed Adam. The land will bring forth what? It's thorns, in the next verse, is, verse seven and eight that, that Zach was just yep. saying. Bri- thorns and thistles hey, and briars. Oh, bingo. Yep. yep. Because Adam did that, yep. thorn, he said he will work the land by the sweat of his brow. And what's he going to get? Thorns and thistles. And look, it's mentioned right there. Was it verse seven? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, verse eight. For, for verse the eight. earth, because I, I, I was thinking, what, I, just before Zach said, yeah, what about verse seven and eight? It's it's like, but I was just sitting there going, for the earth, which drinks in the rain, what, you know, it's like, okay, we're talking about Noah's flood, what, what, that comes often upon it and brings forth herbs. This is what he did for, for Adam and Eve, right? He said, look, every green herb is shall be meat for you right for them by whom it is dressed so god dressed the garden for adam and eve and he told them just don't eat from this tree but that's the one the one tree they had to go to it right they received blessing but that which bears thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing well, that's kind of that kind of reminds you of the fig that, that kind of reminds you the fig tree. Kind of reminds you the fig tree. Jesus cursed too, right? Didn't didn't Jesus curse the fig tree? So let, let no one ever eat fruit from you again. I think that's talking about Judaism. Yeah, that is true. But now with him. This is the important thing. We're right. What? Is... I don't know. I'm going to go to bed. I'm about to pass, pass out over here. All right. Well, everybody's dropping out. I guess we'll stop on verse 12 then, and we'll try to finish 13 through 20 next time. Yeah. All right, All right everybody, everybody, especially the 
millions and millions of followers of Albert's channel. Um, I know you guys have longed for this session. Um, again, just subscribe, follow, yeah. hit the like button below. Uh, again, we're going to do a free raffle. We're going to pick somebody that's... Um, <laughs> You know how all those YouTubers be doing stuff like that? Dude. <laughs> yeah, I think we'll all be dead and gone before he hits a million subscribers. But uh, Wouldn't it be crazy if this actually right now has been broadcasted across all platforms? We just didn't know. It's a miracle. All right, yeah, well, anybody who thinks that, go listen to my Holy Spirit classes. All right, guys, y'all have a good, <laughs> have a good one. I'm going to end the recording here. Good stuff tonight. Hebrews 6, 1 through 12, pick up on verse 13 next time. Thank you.